This is Wadi Crap. Oh, Lordy, look at that. This is Patala Palace, one of the holiest buildings in Tibet, the Dalai Lama's residence. Tiffy, never ever tell the Russians you drink. As usual, I'm standing at the wrong side of the station. It's a lovely thing about travelling on your own. People aren't threatened by you. Ciao. Welcome to Bangkok, home for a while until I make tracks for Cambodia. The last time I was here I hated the place, but this time it's different. This is where I live in Bangkok. Um, last time I was here was four years ago. And I stayed in a really busy part of town and I hated the city, absolutely loathed it. This time I live in this nice wee quiet area, it's called uh, Tanon Sam Sen. And it's northwest of the centre of the city, I suppose. And just a nice wee conglomeration of soys, which is what they call alleyways in, in uh, Thailand. And kids riding their bikes around in the afternoon. It's lovely. It's really, really nice. That's the laundry where I get the washing done. That's the Thai flag draped across the roof for the awning. Thais love their flag. Oh, Sorry, man. Another disappointed tuk tuk driver. Now, why would you bother doing your own laundry when you can get it done at these prices? Plus, about 50p a kilo. Listening to this sing song language. Right, time to go into town, I think. All aboard! This is easily the best way to travel point to point in Bangkok, the river ferry. You're squeezed in with the locals, the crack's mighty and you've got the best views of the city from the Chao Phraya River. Nothing else for it but to sit back, relax and enjoy the taxi ride. kind of an example of what Asia is like. If you had boats like that in Belfast, you'd have to have loads of big guardrails around them and everybody would have to be insured up to the hilt. Here, you know, if you're clumsy enough to not be able to put one foot in front of the other and stupid enough to get on a boat and you hurt yourself, that's your own fault. So the people, <laughs> people that are stupid and clumsy don't get to spoil the fun for everybody else in Thailand. And the Thai people are that nimble anyway. I honestly don't think they even need boats that way. See them all skipping about. Great. You know, one of the things that frightens me about Southeast Asia is the pace of change here and the way in which places like Malaysia, Singapore and Thailand are upping their game. Particularly in the cities. Everywhere you see societies in transition from second to first world economies. In the 90s these places suffered from crisis after crisis but now they're on the turn. I get the distinct impression this part of the world will become the powerhouse of the planet in the next 10 to 20 years. Today, Bangkok's like one big building project. Within this ever-changing landscape though, there's one constant, and that's the Thai royal family. In particular, the King of Thailand, His Majesty Bumibol Adul Yadij. Thais really love their king. He's the longest serving monarch in the modern world, and he's done a lot of good here, he does a lot of good for the people. 
Uh, the Thais aren't too sure about the prince that's coming after him now. I'm not too sure that the royal family will enjoy such uh, popularity in a few years whenever the king goes. It was nice to see people just completely devoted to something. You see his photograph in taxis and tuk-tuks, absolutely everywhere. People get huge big photographs for their houses. Great stuff. Modern Thailand is at one with itself and its monarchy. It's a stable society where democracy holds sway most of the time. I'm about to travel north to the Thai, Myanmar or Burmese border. The bus to May South. I'm going to have to be really quick here because it's going to run off in a minute. I want to meet up with some people living in the refugee camps outside May South. They're fleeing from the Burmese authorities. The Thai bus has got air conditioning. Lovely big seats, it's really clean. You can get a wee snack on the way. The in bus entertainment leaves a lot to be desired, though it's, I don't know what you would describe this music as, but I prefer the music in the buses in South America. I sit back and relax for six or seven hours to a nice hot. At this stage, I've no idea if I'll be allowed into the refugee camps, but it won't be for the want of trying. It's been a very frustrating morning. Uh, I'm just walking back into May Sot. I've got the taxi driver to leave me off at the edge of town so I can walk off my frustration. Went up to see the uh, see if I could see the refugee camps and the Thai police stopped is not too far out of town. Wanted to see all the papers and you need a special permit to go up there, which I of course didn't have. Didn't know you needed one. And uh, we got turned back anyway, so I'm not going to see it. Uh, the reason why they're there is because they're ethnic minorities who have been fighting with the Burmese government in the hills around here. Uh, the Burmese government, in case you don't know, are a bunch of Nazis. They like to put their political opponents under house arrest or in prison or even kill them. They also like to employ six-year-old children to build railways and let them starve to death or die of thirst whilst they're doing so. One of the reasons why I'm not going into Burma, which is only four kilometers away from here. So today, It'll be just uh, mooching about May Sot, and it's a nice wee place. It's full of Thai Muslims who do a lot of gem trading here. It's a border town. And you can get nice curries and everything here. So we'll just go in and have a look because there's some smashing looking temples around here as well. May Sot it is for the day. Nice way to spend a Sunday. While you wouldn't think it to look at its friendly marketplace, May Sot's also a centre for black market timber and precious gems. Now, what's happened in nearly every market has happened here as well. Everybody wants to have their uh, see themselves on film. I filmed a couple of people there and let them see themselves. Everybody else is just queued up to see themselves on camera. Not a camera shy nation, the Thais. And well justified actually because they're beautiful looking people. Birds as well. Turtles. Oh my god, you can buy turtles here. This is the pet shop, by the way. Locusts? Oh my god, I think these are dead locusts. They might be eating these. Ah yes, this is the food part of the stall. Yeah, that bit's the live bit of the stall. What are you looking at? Oh, frogs! <laughs> Frogs! He's got live frogs. I think they eat these here, by the way. There's an experience you don't get every day. You look at a stall and you think, what's a food and what's a pet? <laughs> I think they actually eat the frogs, but I'm sure they don't eat those wee birds. There's not much eating on them. But uh, everything else, I think, is game, sort of game for uh, being eaten around here. Oh, it's hard being high in Thailand. Right. Oranges, 15 baht for a kilo. Well, the day didn't start too well. Couldn't get out to the refugee camps. But May Sot has proved itself a very charming wee town. You just mooch about the market and everybody comes to see what they look like on the TV camera. And you buy a kilo of oranges for less than the price of one orange back home and you sit in the sun in the late afternoon looking at Wat Chumpong, this gorgeous big golden spire that goes up you can see it from loads of places around May Sot and you just do what everybody else here does in the late afternoon you sit and contemplate life and eat an orange it's great
I'm afraid it's bye bye Thailand, hello Cambodia. My first stop was a place I've wanted to see since I was a child, the temple complex at Angkor. It's the world's biggest religious monument. It took two centuries to build and it's one of mankind's greatest architectural achievements. By comparison, St Paul's in London and St Peter's in Rome pale into insignificance. Exactly the same thing is happening as happened in Tikal in Guatemala. As soon as the uh, sun starts to rise, the clouds come out. <laughs> I think I'm cursed. Still, it's nice. We started a restoration project here because nature, this is the jungle, was trying to take over all of the temples. So they took it all apart, stone by stone, numbered all of the stones thinking that they'd get them all back together again. And they were just about to start when the Khmer Rouge started their war here, a very vicious war in Cambodia. So this place was bombed to smithereens and there was a lot of fighting around here. And they lost the drawings, they burnt the drawings. So from 1998 until now, 2005, they've been trying to rebuild this place stone by stone. <laughs> now, when you get to build an aeroplane, somebody tells you to build an aeroplane, they give you a drawing, which makes it all very easy if you're an engineer. Here, all the drawings were burnt and they're trying to put this stuff together blind. And there's literally thousands of stones lying on the ground here, all with numbers on them. <laughs> That's not a job I would want. Aerial view of Angkor Wat and the other temples. This is what happens when men move out, the jungle moves in. The place is ruined now, they moved out six centuries ago. And big trees like this. They're just covering the uh, architecture. It's almost as impressive as the carvings themselves. <laughs> In 802 AD, the Khmer Empire decided to declare independence from Java, and the kings, the god kings, that they had built these temples in Angkor between then and the 12th century. You have to ask yourself why, I suppose. And I think the reason why is the reason why kings do anything. It's because they can. <laughs> Just power goes to their head. And they had an unlimited workforce. They had these guys, elephants, and they could put all this stuff together. Uh, Ta Prom, for instance, the lovely place where they filmed uh, the Tomb Raider movie, actually took 80,000 people just to maintain it. So imagine how many it took to build it. <laughs> it's amazing to think that, you know, human beings can come on this planet and leave this much of a mark. This is my favorite temple, I think, in the whole place. It doesn't appear in any of the guidebooks. It's called the Eastern Mibon. And I just love the fact that hardly anybody else comes here. And I've been sitting here for an hour by myself and not another sinner has turned up. Great. Just need to find a bit of shade now. Three decades of war in the last century in Cambodia have left a frightening legacy. These musicians at Bante Srai Temple are all victims of landmine explosions around Angkor. Warring factions planted millions of mines across this country. The worst offenders were the Khmer Rouge in the 1970s, led by their genocidal leader, Pol Pot. If these poor souls don't perform, they simply won't eat. 
Cambodia now has one of the highest rates of physical disability in the world, thanks to landmines supplied by the Russians, the Chinese and the Americans. The money they made from their arms fest would feed this nation many, many times over. nicest things about Bente Sarai is that it's a good bit off the beaten track. It's a good 17 kilometers out of the main temple complex and everybody comes here as their first stop and then they all scuttle off to the other temples. So you're left at half 11 in the morning with the place pretty much to yourself, just a few other tourists knocking around and a wee Khmer band playing in the background. It's a lovely atmosphere here, probably something like it was six or seven centuries ago when people were here. and. Uh, it always reminds me of the story my sister told me. She was in Concord once and I was deadly jealous. I'd always wanted to go in Concord and she said, do you know what Michael, you didn't miss too much. Uh, it wasn't the grandest inside, it just gets you there fast. But uh, of course Concord was always brilliant to look at at the end of the runway. I saw it a few times in my life. And temples are a bit like that as well, you know. Sometimes you just sit outside them. You don't notice all the wee tiny carvings, but you get the idea of what the architect was about. And, uh, it's nice just to sit here and chill out. They were made for contemplation and uh, that's what I'm going to do now. Just sit and try and get them the whole picture and not worry too much about the tiny details. It's lovely. Nice wind getting up as well. From Angkor, I'm headed for the town of Siem Reap. From there, I hope to make my way to the capital of Cambodia in unusual style. I'm going to Phnom Penh on a boat from Siem Reap. This is the boat for Phnom Penh. And this is what life's like in backpacker land. Everybody just roaring to get on the boat. I'm going to have to get on this boat because I left my bag to keep my place up on the roof. The five-hour boat trip along Ton Le Sap Lake is punctuated by floating villages or villages built on stilts. These water people eke out a living from fishing. Local children travel to school by boat and at one stage in the journey we saw some playing football on a floating pitch. Now there is human ingenuity for you. During the dry season the lake drains quite a bit, but in the wet season it's refilled from the south by floodwaters from the Mekong and Ton Le Sap rivers. 40% of the Mekong lies inside China and construction work going on upriver has reduced fish catches here by a half. 
So China's economic miracle is directly affecting the livelihoods of thousands who rely on this lake for their survival. Phnom Penh, Cambodia's capital. This is home to two million Cambodians squashed together where the Mekong River meets the Ton Lai Sap. The traffic's mad here and there aren't too many driving on these streets with an official driving license. But there are decent and quietly spoken people who've lived through the worst of times. So what happened to Cambodia after the god kings of Angkor had the reign between the 9th and 12th century? Well it basically disappeared off the map until about the 19th century when the French came here and this was part of French Indochina along with Vietnam and Laos. The French weren't very interested in poor old Cambodia because they had a lot more economic possibilities in Vietnam. And in 1950 they gave the, Cambo uh, they gave the Cambodians back their country and put King Sihanouk in charge. King uh, Sihanouk then had some very erratic policies for a while, <laughs> as kings tend to. He was a film producer in that, and he seemed to be more concerned with that sort of thing than running the country, I think. Uh, and in 1970, the Vietnam War, a big event in recent history in this part of the world, reached its peak. Uh, communist forces going into South Vietnam uh, were coming in through Cambodia and were being probably aided by the Khmer Rouge the Red Khmer Forces. So the Americans came up with a typical American solution to that. They went over and carpet bombed Cambodia, uh, killing thousands and thousands of innocent Cambodians in the jungles. And the uh, Vietnamese and Khmer Rouge retreated back into the jungle. In 1975, Phnom Penh fell, two weeks before Saigon. And the Khmer Rouge came in and just basically turned the clock back to year zero and planned to start a Maoist regime here. Uh, that regime was brutal. Uh, I wore glasses. I would have been killed. You were killed for wearing spectacles. You were killed for knowing another language. Any sort of education was immediately suspicious. And they murdered about two million Cambodians between 1975 and 1979. Uh, this brutal part of history is still preserved around here amongst some of this quite nice architecture. I'm going to go now and visit a school which was a torture prison. They converted the school into the torture prison. And the man who orchestrated all this, Paul Pot. Paul Pot died in 1998 after a show trial from the Khmer Rouge. But while he was here, he certainly wreaked havoc in the country. What a beast. These are the instructions that had to be obeyed by the human beings imprisoned here at Tual Saleng, or Prison S21 as it was known by the Khmer Rouge. This is a grim memorial to the thousands who died here. Only seven people survived this place. This is the first room that I've come into in S21. This bar would have had uh, four prisoners shackled to it. This room probably would have contained between 30 and 50 prisoners, all waiting to be tortured. Uh, I've decided that I'm not going to get a guide on this particular tour because this is a very personal return for me to this place. And uh, I just don't want a guide talking facts and figures at me the whole time. Uh, what's in here speaks for itself without a whole load of facts and figures. Let me see this. This will really turn your stomach. This is where prisoners were kept. They built these makeshift cells. And you spent your time in one of them. Yeah, they keep quiet. Very little food 
and you would be here for two, maximum four months. And after four months, you were killed, exterminated. So stay. And this is your cell. I'm six feet. Walls come up to just about my eye level here and more than my eye level here. It's about the length of my body and a couple of feet long. There's no mattress, she just slept on the floor. There was a guy here, or a woman, or a child in the next cell, but of course you couldn't talk to them because you weren't allowed to make a noise. You weren't allowed to make a noise if they whipped you or if they gave you an electric shock. Imagine being this close to another human being, having them just in the cell next to you, the other side of this brick wall, and you can't even communicate with them. That must have been really frustrating when you're stuck in here waiting to be tortured. This is uh, one of the saddest things I've ever seen in my life. It's uh, the pictures of the people, adults and children, that uh, died here. The Khmer Rouge took the photographs. Ten and a half thousand adults died in this one torture prison and two thousand children. If they arrested you, sometimes they arrested the whole family, even newborn babies, and took them away to get exterminated. So the Vietnamese came, released everybody, and the Khmer Rouge fled to the border of Thailand and um, Laos and lived in the jungles. And after that, 78, 79, and the confusion that was in the country, every Cambodian was on the move to the place where they were born to find out if the family were okay. So the crops wilted, nobody was there to look after the, uh, the farms, and there was a huge famine which killed another couple of hundred thousand. For Cambodia. This is my last day in Phnom Penh, I'm off to Saigon tomorrow and it's lovely just to have a day mooching about the town, floating about markets and uh, trying to get back to normal again. But what I like about Phnom Penh is it really encapsulates all of Asia. You've got the horrors of the history and then loads of people like this just getting on with it. They're all really friendly, they're all got big smiles on their faces. Yeah. Yeah. There you go, see it's not hard bargaining with anybody here. Let's go.